<clears throat> Thank you, Nick. Um, it's great to be here again. I love the Temenos Academy, and I think it's one of the most important, although one of the smallest educational institutions in our country. I'm talking this evening on science and spiritual practices. And this may seem an odd combination, um, but we're in an extreme, extremely new situation at the moment uh, where this becomes unusually relevant. Recent surveys have shown that more than half the population of Britain described themselves as having no religion. And until recently, there's probably no society where most people would have had no religion, no unifying uh, theme uh, to, to their existence. And yet, this doesn't mean that most people are atheists. Atheists in recent surveys are about 13% of the population. The majority of people who say they have no religion still have an interest in spiritual matters and often have spiritual practices. Um, a lot of people call themselves spiritual but not religious. There has now been a lot of scientific studies of the effect of religious and spiritual practices. In 2012, the monumental Handbook of Religion and Health uh, came out uh, summarizing the result of 2,800 papers published on this subject since the year 2001. There have been many peer-reviewed scientific studies now. 4% um, of them showed harmful effects of religion. Those were mostly for people who were in states of great religious conflict or who felt exceptionally guilty and belonged to religions that made them feel even guiltier. But the vast majority of these studies showed very beneficial effects. People who had religious and spiritual practices, in brief, were happier, healthier, and lived longer. Um, and there have now been a lot of studies of specific spiritual practices. In my book, I discuss seven different practices and the scientific research on them. I also uh, summarize uh, simple ways in which anyone can try them for themselves. Uh, they are meditation, gratitude, connecting with the more than human world, uh, relating to plants, singing, chanting, and music, uh, rituals, um, and pilgrimage. These are all uh, spiritual practices which are part of every religion, uh, but they can also be practiced by people who are not part of religion. We're in a new situation, as I said. Um, I can't talk about all of them this evening, uh, but I'm going to talk, start first with gratitude which is always a good place to begin. Um, there have now been many studies by positive psychologists on what makes people happy. In the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a rise of a new branch of psychology called positive psychology. Uh, and why it's called that is because it's looking on the positive side of things. Until then, almost all psychology had been negative psychology in the sense it was about what makes people miserable. And this is, of course, what psychotherapists deal with all the time, so it's not surprising this was the main focus for people like Freud. Um, but positive psychologists ask what makes people happy. And one of the things they found, one of their most convincing results, is that people who are grateful are much happier than those who aren't. The opposite of being grateful is to take things for granted or feel a sense of entitlement um, and complain. Um, people who are grateful, uh, on the other hand, give thanks for what they've got and they're measurably happier. The critics of this work said, well, of course they're happier. Uh, uh, you know, they're, of course they're grateful, they're happier, but they're, they're grateful because they're happy. Um, and, uh, but they tried to find out whether they're happy because they're grateful. Um, so they've done a whole series of experiments um, which are part of the literature of positive psychology. I'll just summarize one of them. There are lots of them, but in one of them they took groups of people and divided them into three groups at random. One group were asked to write down all the things that had upset them in the previous week, the hassles. A second wrote down a story about something that happened in the previous week. 
And the third group wrote down the things for which they were grateful in the previous week. They tested them at various periods afterwards. The people who'd done the gratefulness exercise were measurably happier than those that had done the other exercises. And the gratefulness exercise that had the greatest effect was writing a letter of thanks to somebody who had helped you in your life that you'd never properly acknowledged and going to that person and reading the letter to them. People who did that were measurably happier for two months afterwards. Um, so the, this shows something that, in a sense, proves the obvious. I mean, my mother and my grandmother both said to me, count your blessings. It turns out they were right, um, that this is a, a practice which has been part of every culture. All religions have thanks and gratitude as part of their regular practice. Many of the Psalms, for example, in the Jewish and Christian tradition, uh, songs of praise and thanks. Many hymns are sings, uh, 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 songs of thanks. Um, so this has been known to many people for a very, very long time. Uh, but now it's got the scientific imprimatur of showing that it has statistically significant effects. Now, meditation is probably the most widespread uh, spiritual practice that's emerged in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, meditation has always been part of religious traditions in Hinduism, in Buddhism, uh, in Christianity, in contemplative prayer, in monasteries and convents, um, and in Sufism, and in other religious traditions as well. Um, it became fashionable in the 1970s, and that's when the scientific investigation of meditation began. In 1974, Dr. Herbert Benson at Harvard Medical School uh, started looking at the effects of meditation because a lot of his students were doing it, mainly transcendental meditation following the Maharishi. Um, and um, he wanted to find out what was going on. Um, he tried it himself. He found it was really helpful. He did a lot of physiological tests. People who meditated uh, tended to have lower levels of stress. Their blood pressure dropped. And it evolved what he called the relaxation response. We have two sides to our autonomic uh, or unconscious nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, the sympathetic nervous system isn't really to do with sympathy. It's to do with fight-or-flight reactions, to do with the heart beating faster so that you can run away or fight. Um, but many people who suffer from chronic anxiety are in a state of fear all the time and have an activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, Benson showed that during meditation, uh, this was greatly reduced and the parasympathetic nervous system became predominant and that's much more to do with relaxation. Uh, that's why he called it the relaxation response. He studied many other physiological aspects of meditation and looked at the effects on it. People who meditate tend to sleep better, um, have less stress in their lives, uh, they're less depressed. Uh, there's now many studies that show meditation relieves depression or protects against it, which is why you can now get prescriptions for meditation on the NHS, because it's been clinically proven um, to help people with mild or moderate depression. Uh, it's as effective or more effective than a course of Prozac or other antidepressants. And more importantly, from the point of view of the NHS, it's cheaper. So uh, meditation is now widely available. The other kind uh, that was developed in the 1970s by John Kabat-Zinn, also in Massachusetts, also a medical man, um, was mindfulness meditation based on the Buddhist techniques of uh, Vipassana. Where Benson worked with mantra-based meditation, Kabat-Zinn with uh, meditation based on observing the breathing or feelings in the body, uh, sensations in the body, without a mantra. And these are the two kinds which are now so widely practiced today. Um, more than 18 million people in America practice meditation now. Uh, it's taught all over Britain too. More than 100 members of parliament meditate regularly uh, at Westminster. Um, and uh, so this is a very, very widespread uh, practice. How many people here, as a matter of interest, meditate or have meditated? Well, that's almost everybody. It must be at least 
So I don't need to tell you about meditation because you know about it from your own experience. Um, but the, um, there have now been studies on the brains of people who meditate, and regular meditators have different uh, nervous connections from those that don't. Certain bits of the brain get bigger or stronger. Not surprising, really, if you lift weights, biceps get bigger, and if you meditate regularly, connections between different areas of the brain get bigger. Uh, there are anatomical as well as physiological differences. So here's a spiritual practice that's very widespread. Um, most people do it without really thinking about what it means. But in all the traditions from which it came, uh, the reason people did meditation was not so they could succeed better at, in love and business, the reason or deal with the stresses of modern urban life. They were doing it because they believed that by uh, contacting or becoming aware of the ground of the consciousness, of the ground of consciousness in their own mind, they were coming uh, into contact with the ground of consciousness of the whole universe, of everything. That they, in the Hindu formulation, Atman is Brahman, the ultimate consciousness is reflected in the minds of everyone, every conscious being. One common metaphor is it's like the, the moon reflected in buckets of water. Every bucket of water reflects the moon differently. They look as if they've got lots of different moons, but they're all reflections of the same one. And that's how they think of consciousness. And so Buddhists and Hindus think that meditation connects you to the ground of consciousness itself. And so do Sufis and so do Christians. But many modern atheists uh, also meditate. Sam Harris, for example, one of the new atheists, in, author of The End of Faith, he's a very militant uh, atheist, has now uh, become an ardent meditator and is now giving online meditation courses. Uh, Susan Blackmore, one of our prominent public atheists, is also a keen meditator uh, and advocates it as a spiritual practice. Um, the interesting thing is that these, both of them call themselves secular Buddhists. Uh, they reject the religion of Buddhism. They think the Dalai Lama is uh, not as good as secular Buddhists because he's still too superstitious, believes in reincarnation and things like that. They think the meditation is just happening inside their head and is uh, like a mental gym inside the brain, uh, and it's all inside the head. Now, you can do meditation and believe that, uh, but the real reason for it in the, all these traditions is much greater than that. And I myself suspect that people who start off as atheist meditators through their own experience may find themselves challenging um, their atheist worldview. They may find that it really doesn't work so well for them after a while because their own experience may lead them beyond it. In, uh, in all religions, there's a practice of rituals, and this is another spiritual practice. Um, every religion, and indeed almost all cultures, have rituals. And one category of rituals are about the nature of the social group and the story that holds it together. And these rituals reenact the stories of origins or the myths of origin. One example is the Jewish Passover ritual. When the tenth curse was visited on Egypt by God, uh, destroying the firstborn of the Egyptians and of their cattle, um, the Jewish people were passed over because Moses told them to kill a lamb and smear the blood on the doorway of their house. And so they were passed over and they escaped. The next day they began their historic journey through the wilderness to the promised land. And this crucial event in Jewish history is reenacted every year in the Passover festival with lamb um, and is a crucial ritual for Jewish people. It identifies them as Jewish. By doing it, you become Jewish. You become part of that tradition. And through doing it, connect back through all those who've done it over the generations to the original Passover. The Christian Holy Communion, itself a Passover dinner, uh, in the same way it connects its present participants with each other, with all who've done it before, right back to the first uh, uh, Holy Communion, the Last Supper of Jesus with his disciples. The American Thanksgiving dinner, a national ritual, reenacts the Thanksgiving dinner of the original settlers in New England 
who gave thanks for their surviving their first year in the New World. And being American, it has turkey as a key ingredient, an American bird unknown in Europe until people settled in America. By taking part in it, people affirm their identity as Americans and connect with all those who've gone before right back to the first Thanksgiving dinner. Now, in many rituals, it's believed that for the ritual to work or to be effective, it must be done in the right way, the same way it's been done before or a very similar way. And for that reason, many rituals involve liturgical languages, ancient languages uh, that are no longer spoken. Uh, like Brahminic rituals in India involve Sanskrit. The liturgy of the Russian Orthodox Church involves Old Slavonic. The liturgy of the Coptic Church, uh, Ancient Egyptian, the only form in which it survives today. People think that they have to be done the same way in order to work. Now, why should that be? Well, the relevant science here uh, is uh, the, the idea of morphic resonance. This is my own hypothesis. And for those who are not familiar with it, I'll give a very brief morphic resonance in a nutshell summary. Um, morphic resonance is the idea that there's a kind of memory in nature. This is an unfamiliar idea in the West, but it's completely familiar in Hinduism and Buddhism, both of which take memory and nature for granted. Uh, so in that sense, it's more in accordance with Oriental philosophies than Western philosophy. In its w widest sense, this hypothesis suggests that the so-called laws of nature are more like habits. Um, things happen the way they do because they've happened that way before. The universe is not governed by eternal laws that were all laid down at the moment of the Big Bang and have stayed the same ever since, but rather by evolving habits or regularities. There's a kind of memory in each kind of thing. Each kind of thing has a collective memory. Each kind of crystal has a collective memory of all similar crystals in the past. Each rat has a collective memory, or tunes into a collective memory of all rats in the past. Each spider of a particular species, as it begins spinning its orb web, um, tunes into the in experience and the web design of all its predecessors. Um, most, much of inheritance from this point of view is not carried in the genes. It's transmitted by morphic resonance on the basis of similarity. Morphic resonance applies to all self-organizing systems. It doesn't apply to non-self-organizing systems like tables, chairs, computers, and cars. Uh, those are put together in factories, but crystals, cells, molecules, plants, and animals, flocks of birds, ecosystems, planets, galaxies, all organize themselves, and I think all have a kind of collective memory. So the key thing here is that the, um, the, the, is the similarity. I think the, the, the most radical aspect of morphic resonance is the implications for our own memories. What I'm suggesting is that all memory works on the basis of morphic resonance, um, except for mechanical kinds like computers with hard drives and so on. Um, and I think our own memory depends on morphic resonance. I think we resonate uh, with ourselves in the past when we remember something. In other words, I don't think our memories are stored inside our brains. That's the conventional materialist view. Um, they must be in the brain, where else could they be? For most people, it's just common sense. They must be in the brain. But more than a century of research trying to find memories in brains has been extraordinarily unsuccessful. What people have found is that certain patterns of activity occur in brains when memories are laid down, when they are uh, 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 being formed. And similar patterns occur when they're being retrieved. But in between, they vanish. And I think the reason they vanish is they're not there. I think they're not there any more than the... Uh, traces of what you watched on television last night are inside your television set. I think our brains are more like TV sets than video recorders. Now, this in itself has a lot of implications for spiritual practices because if your memories are stored in your brain, then when you die, they're all wiped out at one stroke. That's the end. That's why materialists um, like this argument because it refutes all religious beliefs about survival of bodily death at one stroke. Memories are in the brain, they're wiped out at death, therefore there's no memory surviving death, no possibility 
of survival of bodily death, either through reincarnation, which must involve a transfer of memory or habit, or in purgatory, which must involve some kind of uh, memory, um, or to take an extreme Protestant view of the last judgment, uh, where you go to sleep and then you wake up again uh, to and appear before your maker on the last day. But if you've forgotten who you are and what you've done, it would not be a very meaningful experience. <laughs> All these theories presuppose the survival of memory. Um, uh, I'm suggesting that uh, the memories are not wiped out by the death of the brain because that's not where they're stored. Now, the question of whether they can be retrieved in some other way is another question. It's an open question. Um, but the, it's from the materialist point of view, it's not an open question. It's a closed question. Now, coming back to rituals, the point about rituals is that people do them as similarly as possible because they think that's the right way to connect across time with those who've done them before. And from the point of view of morphic resonance, that's exactly what's happening. The more similarly they're done to the way they've done before, the right words, chants, phrases, gestures, smells, it's food, etc., uh, the more they'll tune into those who've done them in the past. There'll be literally a presence of the past through the performance of the ritual, which is exactly what people think is happening when they do these rituals. So they make great sense from the point of view of morphic resonance. Now this, of course, is a controversial theory. Uh, most of my scientific colleagues still believe in eternal laws of nature, um, but they do so not because they've thought long and hard about it, but usually because they haven't. Um, and uh, it's just a habit of thought. There's another kind of ritual I want to talk about, which is uh, to do with rites of passage. Many cultures have rites of passage, particularly for uh, adolescents, as they pass from childhood to adulthood. And many rites of passage involve trials by ordeal, people going to the edge of death and then coming back again. Many of them involve the imagery of death and rebirth. In some cultures, these rites of passage, particularly ones for boys, are ones that involve extreme physical uh, suffering and challenge. Native Americans have vision quests where people fast and go into the wilderness for days in great danger, um, and some die. Uh, the Mithraic rituals in the Roman period uh, involved rites of passage which were, uh, brought people close to death. The Roman emperor Commodus um, was a, a, a kind of Mithraic priest, and he insisted on doing some of these initiations himself, uh, officiating at them. He went too far. He actually killed one uh, aspirant uh, Mithraic uh, person who was being initiated. Uh, they, they, went, they go to the edge. Well, we know now a lot more than we did before about near-death experiences as actual experiences. These have been widely studied in medicine because nowadays so many people who would have died in the past no longer die thanks to coronary resuscitation techniques and modern medicine. So near-death experiences are now far more common than they ever were before, and they've been documented and studied in great scientific detail. When people nearly die in a near-death experience, they often find themselves floating out of their body, often looking down on their body and see nurses and doctors working on their body. And then they often find themselves going through a long, dark tunnel and emerging into the light where they find themselves in a state of love and bliss and often meet loved ones, departed loved ones, or spiritual beings or beings of light. These are very well documented and many people have rather similar experiences. It's not just the experience which is so important and interesting for those who have them, but the effect it has on their life thereafter. Most people who've had near-death experiences say that it's changed their life, that they've died and they've been reborn, and that they've lost the fear of death. And many of them change the way they live. They start doing more to help other people, uh, and they uh, take on a more spiritual, their life takes on a more spiritual tone. Now, in the light of this knowledge we now have about near-death experiences, looking back, uh, a lot of these initiation rituals make much better sense. 
The one that I think is, is thrown into sharp relief by this is the central initiation ritual uh, in the Christian tradition, namely baptism. John the Baptist uh, was extremely popular at the time when in, in, in Palestine, and he baptized people in the Jordan on quite a large scale. This was a mass movement. Um, people showed up at the Jordan. John initiated them through baptism. Uh, he held them under the water, and they then later said they died and they'd been born again. Well, what was going on? Was this just symbolic of death by drowning? Or, or was it something rather more? I personally think it was rather more. Why have something just symbolic when you can have the real thing? It only takes a couple of minutes longer. And, uh, <laughs> and it's far, far more effective. Um, so I think he was a drowner. And, um, <laughs> and I, I imagine that people would queue up on the banks of the Jordan, and, and he probably had a team of helpers to help the resuscitation process. And, um, one after another would be held under, and, and then they'd go off, and I, think, I suppose he'd say, next, please. Um, he did it on a large scale. Jesus himself was baptized by John, and it was a moment of comp a, a spiritual illumination for Jesus. It was the very beginning of his public ministry. He, straight after it, he went into the wilderness for 40 days of fasting, a kind of vision quest. Um, so this was a fundamental rite of passage. But by, to, by the second or third century in the early church, uh, people had more or less given up baptism by total immersion because people were no longer being converted themselves. It was their children who were born into Christian families and they wanted their babies protected. So infant baptism through the sprinkling of water began. Then it was just symbolic. Um, interestingly, in the ferment of the Reformation in the 16th century, um, one of the most radical Protestant groups uh, were the Anabaptists. Anna means again. The Anabaptists were people who reinstated uh, adult baptism by total immersion. And these were people who were extremely radical. They were a terrible problem for the authorities in both Catholic and Protestant countries. They were persecuted. Um, they were dismissed as enthusiasts, which was a terrible term of abuse. Enthusiasm means filled with God. And uh, they went round being filled with God, saying they'd died and they'd been born again and they'd seen the light. And this was an awful nuisance to the Anglican Church and the Roman Church, and they were persecuted, and many of them went to America as a result, where there are a great many of them still. Um, they gave rise to Mennonite and Baptist churches, which still exist today, and which still among, alone among most, well, a few other Christian denominations have baptism by total immersion, but they're the ones that preserved it. I think that they rediscovered the power of this initiation uh, through death and rebirth. And of course, both they and John the Baptist were doing this uh, before the days of health and safety lit uh, uh, legislation and also before the days of liability litigation. Um, they may have lost a few, uh, but um, uh, these, it was an incredibly powerful rite of passage. And still today, it's the Baptists of all Christian groups who are the ones who go around talking about being born again and seeing the light and uh, dying and being born again. Um, I think for many in that tradition, it's a real experience for many of the people. Probably today, they, they're much more careful about how long they hold them under. Um, but uh, there, again, is a ritual, a rite of passage, where I think modern science has some light to shed on it through studies of near-death experiences. Now, singing and chanting are a, a spiritual practice found in all traditions, um, and they have powerful effects on the mind and body. My wife, Jill Purse, has been teaching singing and chanting in group contexts for decades now, and has shown, I think, totally convincingly how people from any religious tradition or from none uh, can learn and benefit from doing these practices. Um, chanting together brings people into resonance with each other. And if they chant mantras, 
then they come into resonance with all those who've chanted them before. Mantras are a way of tuning in by morphic resonance uh, to all those who've chanted that phrase before. This is something Jill explores in her workshops and, um, and gives a direct experience of. Um, when people sing together in choirs, they often uh, come into physiological synchrony. And this is something that Dr. Guy Haywood, who's here this evening, who works with me uh, as my postdoctoral research fellow, uh, uh, did for his PhD thesis at Cambridge on the physiological uh, and other effects of singing in choirs. Many people find that singing together is extremely beneficial. Um, and that's why so many people join choirs, and there's a resurgence of community choirs uh, uh, in Britain at the moment. And again, this is something that can be done in a religious context, as in church choirs, um, or uh, in a secular context, as in community choirs. But in both cases, people are singing and chanting together and coming into resonance with each other. The practice of pilgrimage is common to all uh, religious traditions. Muslims go to Mecca or Medina or Jerusalem or to the shrines of Sufi saints. Hindus go to Mount Kailash or to the many temples in India or to sacred groves or holy rivers like the Ganges. Um, the, um, the, and, and Christians uh, in the early Middle Ages went primarily to Jerusalem, but then a great many other places of Christian pilgrimage grew up. Uh, some of them were ancient sacred sites which were Christianized um, and became part of the Christian tradition. Others were places where saints were buried or who'd received visions or where their relics were kept. And so by the Middle Ages, the whole of Europe was crisscrossed with pilgrimage routes. Uh, England was, um, as, as were all other countries. These were enormously important. Um, they were, uh, many pe people didn't have holidays in our present sense, but if they wanted to travel, they went on pilgrimages. And this is something that still happens in India. I lived in India for seven years, and one of the things that impressed me very much in India was how many pilgrims there were and how important this practice was for those uh, who went on them. Um, and it, these journeys, were in, the, in India some went by train and bus, but many of the traditional pilgrims go on foot. And um, these journeys are kind of transformative journeys. It's not just like going for a walk. Uh, there's a goal, a destination to the pilgrimage. I went on quite a few pilgrimages in India myself. And one of the things that I learned is that when you arrive at the sacred place, like a temple, you don't just go straight in. You walk around it first, in India clockwise, the direction of the sun, uh, to make it the center before you go in. Well, here in England, um, there were pilgrimages to Canterbury. Um, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales uh, is a s series of stories told by pilgrims on their way to Canterbury from London around 1380. Um, there was sh the Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham, the Black Madonna in Norfolk. Glastonbury Abbey was a major place of pilgrimage. Hales Abbey in, in Gloucestershire, and many others. But this all came to a halt at the Reformation. The reformers uh, disapproved of pilgrimage. Um, they were scholars, and they looked in the Bible to see if there was anything about Canterbury or Walsingham, and of course there wasn't. So they thought these must just be pagan accretions, uh, which in a way they were. Um, so they abolished pilgrimage. Thomas Cromwell in 1538 issued an injunction against pilgrimage, and pilgrims were barred from going to Canterbury. The shrines were desecrated. Um, the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham was desecrated. The jewels were confiscated by the king. And the image of the Black Madonna was dragged from it, the shrine and burned in a public bonfire. This was deeply traumatic for many people in England. Um, and pilgrimage was also suppressed in other Protestant countries like North Germany and Scandinavia. This, I think, left a great void in the minds of the English and because uh, 
the urge to travel is very deep in our nature. We're all descended from hunter-gatherers, and hunter-gatherers have to travel around the countryside um, to follow the animals they're hunting and to find the fruits and other things they're gathering. You don't get all this just arriving uh, all around you if you stay in one place. So all hunter-gatherers are nomadic, as the Sami people are today who follow the herds of reindeer in, in, in the Arctic. Um, and as the few remaining hunter-gatherer societies still are. The Australian Aborigines, uh, as they went on their annual rounds, um, sang the songs of the places they visited, the song lines. Um, and this was just the way they lived. So it's very deep in human nature. When settled agriculture began, 10,000 years ago or so, and in Britain only about 5,000 years ago, um, people settled and were cultivating animals and plants. But these urges to go to holy places remained. And our great uh, uh, megalithic sites in Britain, like Stonehenge and Avebury, were places, were not temples at the center of cities. They were places where people would have gone for festivals at the summer solstice and at other times. So they weren't vast settlements like they were in Sumeria and so on, where the temple was at the center of the city. They were ceremonial centers to which people went for festivals, and those migrations to the festivals were a kind of pilgrimage. The same happened in Athens, where there was a pilgrimage every seven years for the Panathena festival on the Acropolis, where colonists from all the Athenian colonies came back to Athens. And the procession uh, at the end was a kind of formalized migration up to the uh, Acropolis. Um, so these, uh, these go very, very deep, these patterns in our nature. And when the English were deprived of pilgrimages, um, it left a void which was replaced or partially replaced a few generations later when the English invented tourism. And I think tourism is best seen as a form of secularized pilgrimage. Um, tourists still go to the great temples and cathedrals and sacred places of the world. Um, when they go to Egypt, they visit the temples. When they go to Paris, they go to Notre Dame. When they come to London, they go to Westminster Abbey. Tourists are still going to the great sacred places, but when they get there, they can't kneel down and say a prayer or light a candle because they're supposed to be modern, educated people who've risen above all that kind of superstition. Um, uh, so they have to pretend they're interested in art history. Um, so guides spring up to tell them facts which go in one ear and come out the other, um, uh, which uh, isn't really why they're there at all. So um, I think actually even better than secular pilgrimage. I like the phrase of Will Parsons, who with Guy Hayward is a co-founder of the British Pilgrimage Trust. He calls it frustrated pilgrimage. Um, and I think one of the big paradigm shifts in the modern world is back from tourism to pilgrimage. There are already various groups uh, leading pilgrimages rather than tours. Um, and I think all of us can um, can do something in this way. When we visit ancient uh, sacred places, try and make it a pilgrimage. So you at least give thanks for being there and pray when you're there. It's easy in cathedrals now because they all have candles that you can light and candle racks where you can light them. Um, so it's particularly easy here uh, in, in Europe uh, to do that. Um, so I think this is a, a, a very big shift that uh, any one of us can make. We can also make our journeys into pilgrimages. I myself, when I visit a new city or town, or uh, wherever I am, in India, or in Britain, wherever, uh, I try to go first, as soon as after I arrive as I can, to the sacred place at the heart in India, to the main temple, in an English city to the cathedral, or a European city, in a village to the parish church. Um, and then light a candle or say a prayer, connect with the sacred place first, uh, making even ordinary journeys into pilgrimages. It makes a huge difference, I find, if by connecting with the sacred heart of a place. Um, and uh, it makes a completely different feeling of the relationship to being there. <laughs>
Here in London, uh, many people are not aware of the great power spot at the very centre of our city, at the very centre of the uh, English state, uh, which is in Westminster Abbey, the shrine of St. Edward the Confessor, who was for a while the patron saint of England before St. George took over. Um, St. Edward the Confessor died in 1066. Um, he was succeeded by Harold, and then there was the Norman Conquest. Uh, the Westminster Abbey was built around his shrine by King Henry III, and the shrine is the center of the abbey. It's behind the high altar where the monarchs are crowned. Um, it's, it, the, the doors from the high altar enter into this shrine, the central focus of the whole abbey, where the tomb of Edward the Confessor uh, is still there. It was the one tomb which survived the Reformation. The bones are still in it. And you can pray at that. There's niches that you can big enough to get into and kneel. You sort of burrow into this medieval tomb. And the place where you burrow in is hollowed out where knees have gone for centuries. It's an extraordinarily powerful place. And every year the, ha, there is a pilgrimage to Westminster Abbey, the Saints' Day for St. Edward's around October the 14th. On the nearest Saturday, uh, there's a national pilgrimage. The, the Abbey is closed to tourists. And uh, groups of pilgrims go from all over. This year, our vicar in Hampstead, a new vicar, uh, 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 announced that he was going to go on this pilgrimage on Saturday, October the 13th, last year, and just asked if anyone would like to go with him. And about 30 of us did. Um, I hadn't heard of this pilgrimage before that. Um, and it was an amazing experience. Arriving there, there were groups of people on foot converging from all over London. Some had come from further afield and just walked the last bit. There must have been about 2,000 people in the Abbey that morning, and it went on all day. And there was a sung Eucharist with astonishing music and a really powerful occasion. And then anyone could file past the tomb and pray at the tomb of Edward the Confessor. It was an amazing experience. Um, and just going to Westminster Abbey is an amazing experience. Uh, another of the projects I do with Dr. Guy Hayward is uh, we, we have a website called choralevensong.org where you can find the time of this wonderful service that happens every day in our cathedrals throughout the land and in most Cambridge colleges. Um, where every day there's 45 minutes of exquisitely beautiful singing and chanting, different music every day, absolutely free, 5 p.m., Westminster Abbey or St. Paul's or Southwark Cathedral. Um, <coughs> well, there's been a remarkable revival of pilgrimage in Europe in the last few decades. I think it, one reason for this is because so many people feel a kind of spiritual void and they're on a spiritual quest. And pilgrimage is an extraordinary way, uh, extraordinarily direct way of expressing a spiritual quest. You're literally on a journey with a sacred destination. Um, and when you go with the intention, uh, when you reach the holy place of giving thanks or asking for some benefit or uh, a blessing, um, you go with an intention. It makes it different from just going for a walk. Um, the most famous pilgrimage in Europe is Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And that was the biggest pilgrimage in Europe in the Middle Ages. But it more or less fizzled out um, in the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, partly because the number of pilgrims from Northern Europe dried up as a result of the Protestant Reformation. Then at the French Revolution, Pilgrimage was banned in France. The, in 1793, during the Reign of Terror, um, they proclaimed reason the state religion and abolished Christianity. Notre Dame became a temple of reason, um, and monasteries were suppressed, and so was pilgrimage. As in the Russian Revolution, uh, following the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, there was an attempt to abolish Christianity entirely. Um, and execute priests or send them to Siberia and suppress all pilgrimage. Well, <clears throat> um, although there were all these attacks on pilgrimage, um, in the 1980s, a number of activists in Spain uh, tried to restore the pilgrimage, and they started by building up the infrastructure. In the Middle Ages, the monasteries provided the infrastructure where people could sleep and have m meals on their, on their journey. <clears throat> 
Um, so they established a series of places where pilgrims could sleep and eat on the way to Santiago. In 1987, um, when, these, when this infrastructure was in place, and they'd already been talking about it for several years, about a thousand people walked to Santiago. Last year, it was about 300,000. Um, lots of people go from all over Europe, all over the world. Many of them are atheists or agnostics. It's not just devout Catholics who do that, do that pilgrimage. Um, and it's helped to trigger off this revival of pilgrimage which is going on all over Europe. Ten years ago, the great pilgrimage in Norway from Oslo to Trondheim Cathedral, where there's the shrine of St. Olaf, the patron saint of Norway, that great route over the mountains was reopened by the crown prince of Norway, and it's now become a major focus of pilgrimage for all Scandinavia. Um, there's a revival of pilgrimage going on in many different countries in Europe. And here in Britain, the British Pilgrimage Trust is, uh, is the main body which is organizing this revival. One of the things that's happening is, a re is a, to reestablish a flagship route, an iconic route from Winchester or Southampton to Canterbury, about 18 days, much of it going over the South Downs through extraordinarily beautiful countryside, um, and uh, establishing uh, places where people can stay and, and get food and so on, so that it's possible for us to have a kind of Camino here in England. Right now, anyone who wants to do a long pilgrimage usually says, oh, I must go to Spain, but there's no need to go to Spain. You can do it here. Um, and on the British Pilgrimage Trust website, there is now a directory of more than 30 different pilgrimage routes throughout Britain, which anyone can do. It's surprising how many there are. Um, last year, somebody told me about one that um, I actually went on myself, um, which was to um, Little Gidding in Huntingdonshire, where T.S. Eliot is the, the title of one of the four quartets, named after a, a community there founded in the 17th century by Nicholas Ferrar. And this was a local pilgrimage re led by a priest from Peterborough Cathedral, about 70 or 80 people on it, went, started at the village church where George Herbert used to be vicar, the great 17th century poet, um, through, the, through the, the lanes and villages uh, to Little Gidding itself. It was a wonderful pilgrimage um, and uh, wonderful to be able to go on it. And I myself have recently been uh, doing a series of pilgrimages with my godson. I have a, a godson who's now age 17. When he was 14, I tried to think, what can I do with this uh, young man for his birthday? And his birthday is in June. Um, and I didn't want to give him stuff because everyone's got too much stuff. And I try to avoid giving stuff now. I give experiences. And so uh, at that stage, Guy and Will were just starting up this new pilgrimage, the, the exploring the routes to Canterbury. So I said to him, well, what I offer you for your birthday um, is a pilgrimage to Canterbury. I said, we walk the last eight miles or so. We take a train to a small village called Chartham, and we walk uh, through the fields and meadows and orchards uh, and woods to Canterbury Cathedral. I said, then we uh, walk round the cathedral, circumambulate it, we go in and light candles and say our prayers for our intentions. Then we have a cream tea. Um, then we go to Coral Evensong, and then we come home on the high-speed train. Would you like to do it? And I didn't know what he'd say, but without hesitation, he said yes. And we had a most blissful day. And then it worked so well that the next year uh, we uh, went to Ely Cathedral. We went to Water Beach on the train and walked the last eight or nine miles along the towpath of the Cam. Similar formula, Shrine of St. Ethelreda, Cream Tea, Coral Evensong. Uh, last, uh, the next year we did Lincoln, uh, walking along the Lincoln Ridge. And the most recent one, last June, was Wells Cathedral, uh, walking through the fields to that wonderful Cathedral of Wells. Since there's at least 50 cathedrals in Britain, this could run and run as a, <laughs> as a project. Um, uh, I mentioned this. I did a, 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 a talk with the comedian Russell Brand recently for his podcast, uh, which is on YouTube and on his podcast site. Um, he asked me to do this because Russell Brand is now on a kind of spiritual mission. Um, 
he recovered from heroin addiction and alcohol addiction and sex addiction and several other addictions uh, with the help of the 12-step program. And he's recently written a book called Recovery, Freedom from Our Addictions. Uh, and is now going around saying that we, the whole of our society has got stuck in, 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 in this kind of materialist way and there has to be a way out from rediscovering the spirit. So he's become a kind of evangelist for a spiritual path. Um, at the end of our one-hour discussion, um, I mentioned the pilgrimage and going to Canterbury, and he was, loved the idea of going to Canterbury and having a cream tea, and said, <laughs> and going to Coral even so on. It said, ended up with me and Coral, with Russell Brand, uh, uh, deciding to go to Coral even so on together at Canterbury, uh, following a pilgrimage. Since then, um, emails pour into my inbox. Uh, I, I get several a week uh, from people saying, "Just heard your thing with Russell Brand. Can I come too?" <laughs> <laughs> So if we do do it, it could turn into quite a big event. Um, anyway, um, this is a, a spiritual practice, again, which is open to everybody. Um, and in fact, that's one of the key things of the British Pilgrimage Trust, that it's open to all is one of their slogans. Uh, their other big slogan is, bring your own beliefs. Um, because the key thing here is that these spiritual practices are about experience. They're not about doctrines or about dogmas. I myself think doctrines and theology are both interesting and important. Um, but they're not where you want to start. I think that all religions start from experience. Buddhism started from the enlightenment of the Buddha sitting under a tree. It didn't start from people studying texts in a library. Christianity started from the the, the great sense of spiritual opening at his baptism by Jesus and his subsequent life, death, and resurrection. Uh, Islam started with Muhammad hearing the voice of God in, in dictating the Quran. He was illiterate. Uh, and uh, the Hindu rishis, the great seers, uh, arrived at their insights through meditating in caves in the Himalayas and elsewhere, not through studying books. So. I think all the great religious traditions start from direct experience, and for all of us, the things that are most important, really, are direct experiences. Um, and that's why these practices are so important, because they enable us to connect or reconnect through direct experience. For those who don't have a religious path, then I think they provide a way in to the spiritual dimension. For those who do, uh, who are regular churchgoers, who regularly worship at synagogues or mosques or wherever, um, then I think looking at them, uh, these practices in a new way in the light of what science has to show about them can enable us to appreciate them more and uh, they can become more effective in our lives. So, as I said at the beginning, I think we're in an unprecedented situation uh, we have access now to all the spiritual practices of the entire world. Uh, it's never before been uh, uh, that, that situation. Uh, we also have the situation where probably more people than ever before are on spiritual quests. Before, people who had a spiritual dimension to their life could easily fit it into the established religion in which they were brought up and in which they participated. But so many people who have now have lost their ancestral religious roots, they have to search uh, afresh. And these practices provide a way of doing that. Um, this is only a selection of seven spiritual practices. There are many more. Um, so I wouldn't like to pretend this is all there is. I'm, I'm writing a sequel to this book at the moment, which deals with another seven spiritual practices. And even then, there's more. In the next uh, volume, I'm, I'm talking about prayer, uh, psychedelics, uh, because for many people they're a kind of rite of passage today for many young people and can play a spiritual role in their lives. Sports, which I think is the most common way in which most people today reach uh, spiritual states, uh, although it's not normally seen as a spiritual practice at all. But uh, it's, as, as a friend of mine who was a rock climber said to me, he said, when I was really busy, I couldn't get any peace in my life. I tried meditating, my mind was just too busy. But by the time I was 50 feet up a rock face, I was completely in the present. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, and uh, prayer, 
um, fasting. Um, and uh, then uh, I'm, I'm planning to end the book with, you know, lead, just leading better life, because it's one thing to have spiritual practices, but unless it actually shines forth in your life as leading a better life, then it's really a kind of self-indulgence. Anyway, that's all I have time to summarize this evening. And uh, I, I, as I say, I think that we live in an extremely exciting time. Uh, there's never been a time like this uh, in which we can look at spiritual practices in this kind of way. And I think this is going to play an increasing role in our society in the years to come. Thank you.